After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne, around the throne, were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, and the third living creature like, had a face like a man, and, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The fourth the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, He who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord to receive glory and honour and power for you created all things and by you, by your will, they exist and were created. I, I just had a sense this morning, we're there. We were, we're there with those elders, with those living creatures worshipping in that heavenly place. And we, you know, I could see the, the elders casting their crowns before the throne and saying, it's not about us. It's all for your glory. It's all for your glory. The crowns we wear, we throw them towards your throne because it's all about you. It's not about us. And I had that just standing there this morning and thinking, oh, Lord, Lord, you, you, you've opened the door of heaven. You've opened the door, Lord God, that we could, we could look in and be part of, Lord, what is already happening. Lord, that worship and that place of honour and adoration and exaltation. And Lord, we, we stand and worship with those angels and elders and heavenly beings. And we say, Lord, holy, holy, holy is your, your name. Holy are you, Lord God, and only you are worthy of the glory. And so, Lord, as your church, as your people, as one you have drawn into that place of glory where, you know, you, Father, and the Son share that place of glory. You have, you have called us and drawn us into that same place of glory. Lord, we, we worship you with all of our hearts. We we. We love you, Lord, more than we could ever put into words. You are so faithful. You are so good. And Lord, I, I, I just believe you showed me as well that breath of heaven, that wind of heaven just blowing across us. And Lord, that the waters are parting before us. Nothing will stop us. Nothing will hold us back, Lord God, from entering into the fullness of all that you have for your people, for your church, Lord God, in these days. Lord, there'll be no obstacle that would be too great for you because the wind of the Spirit blows. The breath of heaven blows over us and, and breathes upon us. Lord, what more could we want? The breath of God breathing, leading us, making a way, blowing before us. Lord, you are so worthy of all of our praise. And we do, we give you all the glory this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Wow. Wow, what beautiful worship this morning. Oh, we're so privileged. You know what? It's a real privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be part of worshipping God together, glorifying Him, honouring Him. 
being part of the body of Christ. Let's never lose sight of, of that. But it's only because of His grace He's made a way for us. This morning we're going to be um, having communion following the message and uh, Venice is actually going to come and um, she's going to, in a moment, she's going to bring the Word of God this morning and uh, then share communion with us as, as she closes. Um, I just want to pray over the message, um, pray God's blessing upon it, His anointing over Venice as she brings it and um, pray for our tithes and offerings as well. So let's do that. Father, I pray, Lord, we pray and we agree together. We agree together that your word would come to life this morning, that it would touch every heart, that, Lord, you would anoint Vanessa and anoint her with the words that she speaks. It's your word. Lord God, let it penetrate our heart, our spirit. Lord, I just love that word you gave us for the new year, that you have given us a new heart and a new spirit for a new year. And so, Lord, let this word be part of that foundation, part of that declaration that we make and, um, and, and you know, the, the, the building blocks of, of our faith. Let your word build upon that this morning. Um, and so, Father, we, we pray, let your word not return void, but accomplish everything that you have purposed it to do. Lord, we pray over our tithes and offerings. Father, again, what a privilege and what an honour it is to be able to sow into your kingdom. Lord, we are kingdom people and we long to see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And as we join with the angels in worship this morning and, uh, and just, you know, come from, in, in, stay in that place uh, of your presence. Uh, Lord God, we just, we just realise, Lord, how, how little we have to offer you, but Lord, the little that we do, we do have, we give you freely and generously. Um, and we thank you, Lord, for your blessing upon our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's welcome Vanessa. She comes this morning. <laughs> Good morning, Sea Coast. It's a real pleasure to bring the word this morning. And after that worship, that was just incredible this morning. And you might know it, but you've already sung most of my message, <laughs> which is a good confirmation for me too, that we're on track with what God's saying. And his anointing is so here. <laughs> so my message really flows in well from Jim's wonderful word last week that was so encouraging to us all for the start of a new year titled New Heart, New Spirit, New Year, as he just mentioned. And if you haven't listened to it yet, I'd encourage you to go online and hear it. It's a prophetic word to us all who want to become more like Jesus, walk in the Spirit to fulfil all he has called us to be and do. He shared a scripture from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, which is about God speaking to his people Israel. They had been living in wickedness and profaning the name of God, and have been brought into judgment by God and found themselves in bondage in a foreign land. He was going to release blessing upon their land, but also healing and cleansing upon the house of Israel, not for their own sake, but for the sake of exalting his name again amongst the nations, despite their wickedness. The other promise is that they will be brought back from the land of the enemy, the foreign lands, back to their own land. And the scripture was from Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27, prophetic scripture which speaks to us today as well. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. God said he will do it. And these beautiful promises were ultimately fulfilled in Christ and in us when we were born again. Isn't that good news? This was all his work. We only had to have an open heart to receive his spirit, taking away all our striving and striving to be ever good enough to deserve it. It's as we surrender to his spirit also 
that we bear the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. I originally was just going to bring communion message today, which I will share at the end. But the theme for this sermon has really come out of that, the scripture that I had for communion, that I had on my heart. So just to set the scene, it was the night before the Passover feast, and the last night before Jesus was leaving this earth and would be returning to his Father. He was wanting to show his disciples the full measure of his love for them, to the very end, though the enemy had already planted betrayal into the heart of Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray Jesus. And the scripture from John 13, 3 in the Passion says... Now Jesus was fully aware that the Father had placed all things under his control for he had come from God and was about to go back to be with him. Now this verse always speaks to me because it shows how perfectly Jesus knew his identity. He'd come from the Father. He was going back to the Father, his destiny and the full authority the Father had given him to accomplish all he was sent to do ultimately his death on the cross. He chose to do his father's will, not his own, to sacrifice his life on behalf of the whole world for the forgiveness of their sins and the free gift of salvation to all who would choose to receive it. And as we prepare for the new year ahead, not knowing exactly what that will look like or how it will turn out, especially at the moment... (laughs) It's paramount that we know and have the revelation of who we are, our true identity in him, and to know and take up the authority we have as his sons and daughters in Christ. I love Donna's communion message last week also, how we have been redeemed from the curse of the fall. The curse of sin and death ended when Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden and fell out of relationship with him. And Jesus has brought us back into right relationship with the Father and we can now walk and live in all the blessings that Adam and Eve had in the very beginning. That's a revelation, church. I think God wants us to get it. And by revelation from his spirit and meditating in the truth of the word. If you want to know your true identity in Christ, read Ephesians 1. I'll just read a few of those scriptures from verses 3 to 6. And this is from the Passion Translation. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm has already been lavished upon us as a love gift from our wonderful heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus, all because he sees us wrapped into Christ. This is why we celebrate him with all our hearts. And he chose us to be his very own, joining us to himself even before he laid the foundation of the universe. And because of his great love, he ordained us, he set us apart, so we would be seen as holy in his eyes with an unstained innocence. For it was always his perfect plan to adopt us as his delightful children through our union with Jesus, the Anointed One so that his tremendous love that cascades over us would glorify his grace for the same love he has for his beloved one, Jesus, he has for us. Receive that this morning. And this unfolding plan brings him great pleasure. Many struggle receiving this truth because of the things they experience through rejection and abandonment, especially from their parents in early childhood. But God promises to take up those abandoned by their mother and father. It was always his plan to adopt us into his family, that no one would be left an orphan. I've seen it over and over how he takes special care of those orphaned, both physically and emotionally. He goes out of his way to reveal his love to them. I have permission from Tatiana to share something of her experience, which she recently shared that really touched my heart. She was born in a refugee camp in Italy and her parents escaped from their country to come to Australia because of war. Through difficult circumstances, their relationship broke down and Tatiana and her little brother were put into an orphanage. Her father said he would return to get her, but he never did. Despite all of that rejection and abandonment as a small child... 
She always had a deep knowing. She was loved by God and was his special princess. I think that's just beautiful. That's supernatural grace. Obviously, she's been on a healing journey with God of overcoming the traumas she experienced. But knowing him has enabled her to do that. She has such a beautiful heart and compassion for others who have suffered the same rejection and pain. He knows the things we've all experienced. None of us had perfect childhood that were never part of his will or plan and he reveals his love and truth to us. Romans 8, 14 to 16 says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. You did not receive the spirit of adoption again to fear. You received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. God did that in Taniana as a little girl. We sang about it this morning, that we are his children. We have such a rich inheritance as his sons and daughters. All that he has and is, is ours. Can you get that? When we know who we are, we're positioned to fulfil our destiny. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's incredible to think, not only did he know us from the beginning of time, but he prepared good works for us and gifted us to fulfil them. Acts 15, 18 says, No unto God from eternity are all his works. God will bring to pass his plan and purpose until the very end of time. That's really reassuring, despite our failures and weaknesses, but nothing will stop him having his way. In saying that, the spiritual battle for our soul and destiny is very real, and we need to be aware and vigilant in fighting this battle. The enemy is out to thwart and destroy everything that belongs to God and his purpose. We don't have to look very far in all that's happening around the world right now to see the enemy at work. And I won't go into all that. But Jesus is still on the throne. And he is bringing about his salvation and plan for all humanity. And we know the end of the story. The enemy will finally be destroyed and all his cohorts. Amen. John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, this is Jesus speaking, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And he has called us to be overcomers. And some things, all of us, there's not one here who has not had to overcome some things. He has called us to be overcomers. In fact, he says in Romans 8, 37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I love that. He, I also felt today to share on an Old Testament book called Esther as it captures the heart of the message I'm bringing today. Now I know many of you are well acquainted with the story but allow the Holy Spirit to speak afresh to you and what he is saying because he speaks so personally to each of us and I clearly got this um, book that came to mind to share on. And for time's sake, I've had to condense. In fact, I got a little bit lost trying to tell the whole story (laughs) Um, and all the details. There's so much in the nine chapters, but I hope to bring out the main points. I'd encourage you to read the book of Esther if you haven't and maybe read it again. This story is set in Shushan, the capital city of Persia, from 483 BC to 473 BC. During the reign of King Ahasuerus, or other known as King Xerxes. Esther and her guardian Mordecai, who was actually her cousin, had chosen to stay in Shushan as many other Jews who had been in captivity had returned to Judah. Esther had been orphaned by her parents as a young girl and Mordecai had chosen to care for her as his own daughter. I think one of the commentaries said, It was because of her age, otherwise he would have married her and taken her to be his wife, but she was young. The king had put on a huge feast, and wow, they really knew how to party those days. (laughs) He invited all the officials, um, 
and servants to show off his riches and, and wealth and luxuries. And then he opened it, and that went on for quite a time, apparently, and then he opened it to all in Shushan for another seven days. And as he got merry on wine, which he would have been, he asked for his beautiful Queen Vashti to be brought to him to show off her beauty, but she refused to come, which really upset him. And I kind of understand why she might not have come. (laughs) Anyway, that's my opinion. (laughs) I'm sure there's more to that story. It was then decided by the heads, uh, the governors, that her behaviour would affect many other women's behaviour toward their, the honour of their husbands and that the king should choose another queen who would be better than Vashti. Poor Vashti. It was suggested that beautiful young virgins be sought for the king from Shushan and they were to be brought to the women's quarters and given beauty preparations for 12 months. Wow, ladies, how would you like that? <laughs> We all would. The young women, the young woman who pleased the king would be queen. Now, it's such a different time and culture. It's a bit hard to get our head around it, how all this worked. But God's favour was with Esther as she was given into the care of the custodian of the young women. And apparently, some of the commentaries say she was only about 14. Mordecai had told her not to reveal to anyone that she was a Jew. Every day he paced out the front of the women's quarters to hear of her welfare and what was happening to her. As it turned out, after the 12 months of preparation, Esther really obtained grace and favour from the king more than all the other young women and she became queen. This isn't just a nice story about Esther. Even though it has a victorious ending, there was such a spiritual battle going on in the background, as usual. God isn't even mentioned in this book, but he was well and truly at work to bring about his plan and purpose for the Jewish people at that time in history, whom the enemy was out to completely annihilate. The second in charge to the king was Haman, whom the enemy used to bring about a, who the enemy used to bring about a plan to destroy every Jew in all the king's provinces, especially when he found out Mordecai was a Jew. And he had such hatred toward him because Mordecai would not bow down to him. The king, unaware of the evil which Haman had deceived him in concerning the Jews, signed letters to be sent out to every province and people that all Jews were to be destroyed. The letters were sealed with his signet ring, which was never to be revoked. When Mordecai and all the Jews received the decree that they were to be killed, there was much fasting, weeping and distress. Can you imagine? Can't imagine. Esther knew she would be risking her life to go to the king without being called in by him. It was literally a death sentence. This is where the whole purpose for Esther being anointed queen kicks in, God's divine appointment for her and all her people. Mordecai says to her, beautiful scripture in Esther 4.14, For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther then calls a fast for every Jew for three days as she and her maids would also fast. She was willing to die for the sake of her people. She would go to the king against the law. If I perish, I perish, she said. And this whole situation was reversed miraculously by God. But he used Mordecai and Esther's willingness and courage to approach the king and have the decree against the Jews revoked. She was handed the golden scepter by the king, which resembled or which meant power and authority as they touch the tip of that scepter, to be able to request whatever she asked from the king. Haman's whole plan to kill and destroy came back upon himself and his ten sons, and they ended up being hung on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai to be hung on. The Jews were all delivered from death and ended up having such a feast and celebration, which is how the festival of Purim came about, an important Jewish festival. Also, all of the Jews' enemies were destroyed, every one, thousands. 
And Mordecai was, protect, was promoted into the king's palace and had great fame and respect throughout all the land. This is an incredible story of how God can take ordinary lives and bring about his purpose and plan through them despite what the enemy has intended. And so I had a few defining points for us to glean from this story, about eight. Number one, God's favour, grace and sovereignty can cover our circumstances despite difficulties and impossibilities that may scream at us. And they do. Esther went from being an orphan to becoming a queen with all favour and authority. That is just amazing. It is God's, number two, it is God's heart that we are all nurtured, loved and cared for along our journey, just as Mordecai loved and protected Esther. He uses other people to guide and help us to attain our destiny. I'm so grateful for my godly heritage for my loving and caring husband who always wants to see the best, best come out in me. For those who have believed in us and have mentored us, who are still doing that, and for the team around us, we are never meant to do it alone. We can't, in fact. Also, I'm grateful that Seacoast is a generational church with young and older and in between. Christine, you're amazing. I thought of you when I wrote this. Every week you're here and, and people wouldn't know the physical battle that you have to get here at times and you're here every single Sunday with Cheryl and others and little Addie dancing out the front this morning in worship. You know, it's, it's a whole body working together in relationship to fulfil his mandate for us as a church in this community. Number three, humility. Faithfulness and obedience are crucial character traits to possess. Just like Esther respected and she took counsel from those she was entrusted to, which positioned her where God could use her. I believe our character and heart attitudes are even more important than gifting because they're the things that will carry us through the challenges and trials rather than the gift. Number four... As I've already mentioned, we need to be healed from past hurts, rejection and abuse to reach our full potential in God. Number five, it does take courage to take faith steps when you don't see the full picture, and we never do when we step out. But knowing he does helps you as you trust and seek him. God's call and destiny always requires faith steps. And it's always bigger than our natural ability. We need to rely on his anointing upon our life. Number six, at times we're called to speak up, even when it's not popular or there's severe op opposition for a cause or for someone else. Proverbs 31.8 says, Open your mouth for the speechless in the cause of all who are appointed to die. It can be a matter of life and death for someone or people in the natural and spiritually, there's plenty of speechless out there. Number seven, wait on God's perfect timing or we can sabotage what he wants to do in our life, someone else's life or circumstance. Just as Esther planned to go before the king, she fasted and went before him at the appointed time, believing, believing she would be given favour for her request. That's when she received the power and authority to overturn the enemy's plan and revoke the decree against the Jews. It required faith, patience, courage and wisdom. Number eight, trust that God is able to bring about the miracle needed as only he can when we've done all that we can to fulfil his plan. There's our part and there's always God's part which is the most important. The exciting thing through this message for us is that we too have all come into the kingdom for such a time as this, every one of you. There is a spiritual battle raging for souls to come into the kingdom of God and not go to a lost eternity. We have been given this privilege as his children and a responsibility and authority to overthrow the enemy's plan in our families, 
community and nation to see God move mightily by his spirit through us. That's his plan. As Paul encouraged Timothy, I'll finish with this scripture in 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7. Um, it's actually in the um, passion, <laughs> that one. I'm writing to encourage you to fan into a flame and rekindle the fire of the spiritual gift God imparted to you when I laid my hands upon you. For God will never give you the spirit of fear, but the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power, love and self-control. Amen. I'm going to just um, pray and then we'll share around the table of the Lord. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. We have been born for such a time as this. Thank you for the victory, Lord, that you've won on our behalf. And the new identity, the new heart and spirit that you've placed within us once we're born again. Lord, as we sang this morning, I pray you would breathe upon us the breath, the fresh wind of heaven, the fragrance of heaven. Lord, ignite a flame within us again, Lord God. Refresh, revive us by your spirit, Lord. It's only by your spirit. We can do nothing without you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your plan and your purpose. I pray, Lord, that we as a church would accomplish all that you purpose for Seacoast. Thank you for the people that you've brought in, for the giftings. Lord, I pray that you fan a flame afresh upon every person's gift here, upon the vision and plan for their life that you have, Lord God. And Lord, those that may be discouraged or disappointed or fearful, Lord, even at this time when COVID would want to shut us down, would want to bring discouragement, would want to stop the work of your spirit, Lord. We bind the enemy's plan in the name of Jesus and we release the power of your Holy Spirit upon your church, a light in this city, in this nation. We pray for your church, Lord, to arise and become all that you destined it to be. Lord, we, we co-partner with you, Lord. We're heirs of Christ. We are wrapped in Christ. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the victory through your blood and by your spirit, Lord. Lord, we, I call all of us, Lord, into the kingdom to fulfill. You've called us to fulfill every plan and purpose that you have. And Lord, that nothing will stop you moving. Lord, we sense a fresh outpouring of your spirit just about to blow across this land. Lord, for salvations, for souls. Lord, I pray that we would be a people bold and courageous when you call us, Lord, to speak up, to stand up, to rise up, to be the voice and the mouthpiece that you would call us to be. Lord, break off the shackles, break off the fear, break off everything that would hinder a move of your spirit in us. Do that work in us, Lord, that only you can do as we surrender to you afresh today, afresh at the start of this new year. Lord, we are expectant. We know you can do miracles and you are a miracle working God that you keep your word and you keep your promises. Release faith and courage and the anointing of God upon our lives, Lord, from the youngest to the oldest. Pray for the future generations, Lord, that you would raise them up. Lord, you, they would know you at a young age and do mighty exploits in your name. We pray for each person, Lord, every age, because, Lord, while we have breath, we are here still for your purpose and your plan, and we give you all the glory. Thank you, Lord, that your glory in the latter days, you said, will be greater than the former days, the glory upon your people and your house, Lord, and we thank you for that. And we ask this in your mighty and precious name. Amen. Amen. stirred up, don't we? Where the enemy wants to shut down. No way. We're rising up. So as we come around the communion message, the table of the Lord, I'll come back to where I began the night before Jesus was crucified and sharing the last supper with his disciples. 
John 13, 3. Now Jesus was fully aware the Father had placed all things under his control, for he had come from God and was about to go back to be with him. He had demonstrated a deep and tender love for his disciples, and now he longed to show them the full measure of his love before he went to the cross. And I think it's amazing out of all the things he could have shared and discussed with them on the last night, especially because they still didn't really get it. They didn't really get what he meant by his death and resurrection and how that was all going to come about. But he began to wash their feet and wipe them with a towel. And even though he knew who he was, he knew what he was about to accomplish on the cross. He had all power and authority from the Father. Yet he chose to demonstrate to his disciples whom he loved an example of how they were to serve one another after he departed from them. And he said in John 13, 16 and 17, Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. This was a lesson on true leadership, demonstrating humility and servanthood from the king himself toward those he loved. From all that we've heard today, despite whatever our gifting is and our calling, it has to be done with a heart of humility, a heart to serve others, and a heart of genuine love, just as Jesus, our perfect example, was and has showed us through his word. So as we just take the emblems this morning, Lord, I thank you for your sacrifice on our behalf. Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken. Lord, for our healing, for wholeness. And Lord, uh, as we take and eat the bread and the, the wine that represents your blood that was shed for our forgiveness, Lord, you've given us your spirit and all that we need to walk this walk and to live as you lived. And I pray for that humility that servant heart, Lord, a heart of genuine love, that you would remove any pride or any other hindrance or motive from our hearts, Lord, that we would have pure hearts just to serve as you came to save and to serve us, Lord. And you showed that in the most amazing way through your death and resurrection on the cross. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. Lord, we just partake of the emblems now and we praise you and give all glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a knee. listeners this morning. I pray that God has spoken into your heart in some ways through that message and we're just going to finish up this morning with another song. Rocky. <laughs>